what Langacker has to say about schematization, why it is so important for him and for cognitive linguistics. Okay, so schematization. Um, as I already mentioned in the website that I've been building little by little is basically generalization. Of course, this is very um, ambiguous. It's not a very good definition, but it's a helpful one, I think. I don't want to create confusion, so I'm trying to keep everything as understandable as I can. And uh, in that vein, specification is the opposite of schematization. Of course, specification is far more than, um, than what I'm saying here, but we will tackle the most general characteristics of, of specification and schematization. Um, as I already also mentioned, these two fundamental mechanisms of conceptualization work at astonishing speeds. Uh, we already discussed that cognitive neural representations are very complex. Uh, in our minds in real time to process, and I have underscored new information, uh, but they also entrench our most common everyday repetitive cognitive routines. So these two mental processes are heavily used all of the time in order to process both new information and everyday routinary mental processes. And uh, the example I cited, which is an example from Langacker in our website is thing, creature, animal, the, and poodle, where thing is the most schematic of all these different entities and poodle is the most specific of all them. Uh, so let's see in more detail what, what I mean by this um, schematization and specification continuum. So for that, let's remember these examples that we already went through the, the very first time we met in this seminar webinar, where we discussed that we have conceptual prototypes in which we have categories of conceptualization that center around one typical, the most typical member of the category. In this case, there is a certain type of bird such as robins or sparrows that respond to our most common expectations of what we believe a bird looks like, what it does, where it lives, etc. And the same goes for vehicle. We mentioned that different vehicles can be categorized as members of the category vehicle, but not all vehicles are equally central to the category of vehicles. Some of them are more prototypical, some are more marginally categorized as part of this category. The same for weapons, not all potential weapons are equally prototypical. The same for the same goes for furniture. There are different types of furniture, but some furniture are more prototypical of their category. And so what does that have to do with thing, creature, animal, dog, and poodle? Well, as I already mentioned in the website, um, thing is just about anything. Anything that is around is a thing. So vehicles, birds, furniture, and weapons are things. They, they are all different types of things. The, the category thing is very, 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 extremely, very general. Creature, in contrast, is more specific. A thing can be anything, but a creature is more specific. So what about creatures? Um, let's, let's think about creatures for a few minutes. So I also gave you this image in the website and it says here, the kingdom of living things, which is basically the kingdom of creatures or so good Langacker say. And we have here, I could say five kingdoms. 
I've heard that the, that some for some biologists there are more, but that but that's not our issue today. Our issue is that not all creatures are animals. Um, for Langacker or for this analysis that we want to propose, there are other creatures that are not strictly animals. So what is the universe of creatures? It's, it is extremely vast. There are many, many, many different entities that can be called creatures. Um, the universe of things is extremely, extremely far more greater. It's, it's, it's vaster. It has, it includes far many more things than, than creatures. Creatures is a smaller category. It is less schematic than thing. Thing is more schematic. Um, so thing, creature, animal, dog, and poodle. Now let's think about dogs. Um, what in the world could be categorized as a dog? So here I have two examples. Um, and before I show you more examples, let me remind you one principle that I laid out the very first week that we started working on this. Uh, let me read this out. Most often when you are trying to think of the true meaning of a word, what you're trying to find is a representation that you think most others will also accept as the most common exemplar of the theme. So we could ask ourselves, what good the most common, well-accepted instantiation of a dog would be? Which of these two do you think could be the most generally accepted member or typical member, the best exemplar, the one that represents the best this category of dogs. That's of course going to be very difficult. Um, we describe, as I already said once, the things we want to define, but we're thinking about three different mental representations, probably at the same time. Uh, our own mental representation of the thing, in this case, dog, where is my own mental, when I think about dogs, what am I thinking about? What comes to my mind when I think of a dog? Um, what do you believe is also the most common mental representation of the thing for most other people? So if I, if I, if I wanted to define what a dog is, I would be trying right now to think of what all of you have in your mind um, for dog. And of course, that could be a sort of schematization. I would try to find in my mind, what I think you think about dogs as the most common prototypical traits or characteristics of dogs what, that most people could accept. And see what you believe most other people believe about most other people's mental representation of the thing. So I could also think about what you think that I think about dogs. So these are three different representations of what we, what, what we want to define in this case, dogs. And we've got to bear that in mind if, if we are to discuss um, schematization. So these mental representations may coincide to a larger or lesser extent. It, it may be possible that my definition, my understanding, my mental representation of a dog is very similar to the representation that teacher Raimundo has, but very different from the representation that uh, teacher Rocio has and so on and so forth. Um, these representations can either coincide to a larger or to a lesser extent across different people's minds. So here I have a few other examples of other dogs that we might wish to consider. Which of them would be the typical, prototypical, most common member or exemplar, the best, the one that best, rep best represents the category? Of course, that, that could take us quite some time. Uh, it is very difficult to arrive at one single common denominator that fits everyone's expectations. That's why I've been insisting that we have different mental representations. Um, so here, here I have some questions, for instance, what color should a dog be? Should they be, should we define dogs as being brownish? Uh, what size? Is there a standard of size, a size standard so that something deserves to be called a dog better than other dogs. Do they have a purpose? What is the purpose of, of a dog? What do they eat? Where do they live? Are they faithful? Are they used for company? Uh, do we think of dogs as, um, 
particularly in terms of tenderness or for protection. There are many different traits that we could try to use in order to define what a dog is. Um, but that's not really the problem. Um, the issue is not finding a complete full uh, list of characteristics that everybody agrees with. That's not the issue. The, the real issue is that you should ask the questions that I have typed on the right side. What do you think when you think of dogs? That's the real issue. What comes to your mind when you think about either dogs in general or, or a dog in, in, in um, more specifically? What cognitive neural representations do you activate when you think of dogs or dog? Of course, we can try to generalize on what are dogs or we could just think about um, what is that dog? And so here I have another comment on the right side. What is most important is not making a definitive list of the most relevant and defining traits of or characteristics of dogs. But to bear in mind that we all activate different though overlapping, there is some overlapping, some coincidence to some extent. Um, we all activate different cognitive neural representations of dogs at different times, in different places, in different situations, evoking different experiences. So uh, if I asked you all to please think of a dog or dogs with your eyes closed right now, something would come to your mind, probably influenced by the images that I've been showing you and by that discussion that we've been having about prototypes. But if you were somewhere else in a more natural setting in which you were not trying to define what dogs are, something probably something different would come to your mind. Um, here are some um, other dogs that I have included just to make this more interesting. Um, we should try to ask ourselves what comes to our mind when we think of dogs. Here I have uh, some other examples. Does any of these other dogs come to your mind whenever you think of dogs. Of course, I uh, chose these on purpose to be very rare, very weird. Um, but that's the thing that when you think about the category dog, we all have a very general schematic mental representation of what a dog is. And we use that mental representation to identify entities of the world things of the world that we could be willing to accept as members of that category. Um, so you could compare those weird, rare, not very common dogs uh, on the right side with the, with the more common um, sort of everyday uh, dogs that I have on the left side. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the question. Um, what comes to my mind, what comes to your mind when you think of a dog? We have a schematization. Um, a schema is, is basically what do they share? What do they all share? What do they all have in common? Uh, it is difficult to tell because we don't have a, a map, a literal map of the brain. So we don't really know what that schema or schematization of a dog is. But whatever it is, it should subsume generalize uh, whatever there is in common for you, for everyone, for uh, the category dog. Um, and you, we could pick any of these dogs and we, we are going to pick Poodle because it, it does the one in our, our, our original list. So here are different types of Poodles. We, could, we can continue trying to figure out now more specifically, what do poodles have in common? Not what dogs in general have in common, but this time, what do poodles have in common? And that's also going to be interesting or it can become interesting. So here I have other, here I have other exemplars of the category dog, sorry, poodle. And so we have a schema we have a schematization of poodle that subsumes, that includes, that covers all poodles. And of course, some of these are rather weird, rare, um, but to some extent, you could still apply your schema, your schematization of, of poodle 
to, I guess, most of these. And the question comes again, what comes to your mind when you think of a poodle? I guess that not, not that the one here that I'm pointing out with my cursor is not the one that comes to your mind usually when you think of poodles. But uh, still, you use, we all use our schematization of poodles to recognize that there is some poodleness. There is something about poodles having to do with this one and with every other one that, is, that I'm showing you right now. Um, so whatever comes to your mind is very schematic. And when you think of one poodle or see one poodle, it becomes a specific poodle. So if you pick any one of these poodles, it becomes one specific poodle, but you were able to recognize it as a poodle because you have a very general schema of what poodles are. Um, here I have some other examples. Um, the one I find most um, weird, so to speak, is the one uh, here on the left because they're sort of dancing or something. Um, but then again, the question is, how do you recognize that as those are as poodles? Even if you know that there's something you could say wrong or unusual, rare, weird about those poodles, you, we all have a schema that somehow helps us identify or categorize the, all those poodles as poodles, even if you want to call them weird poodles or strange poodles or poodles having a strange attitude or behavior. But you, would, you will still be using that very, very general schema or schematization of poodles to identify those. Um, so let me read this. It's a little bit, not too long, but a, a little bit long. I'm not trying to find the true meaning of poodle. Uh, that's something that I would like you to keep in mind. Nor am I attempting to give you the true schema of poodle. That would be very difficult to, to find because we, as I already said, we don't really have a, a, a map of every single neuron in our brain to be able to tell this is a true schema for one given person or the one that we all share. Um, but I'm just arguing that a schematization of a noun is a generalization of the most abstract nat nature and that such schema is constructed upon all our experiences in life that make up a cognitive near representation of poodles that is not very specific. Um, schematizations are not specific. They can become specific when we use those schematizations to identify specific instantiations of, the, of those schematization. Um, you can make it as specific as you want, but the moment you choose one specific instantiation, this is a very technical term that we use in cognitive linguistics. Instantiation is basically um, picking one exemplar of one category of, of one schematization of the schema. The schema is being specified, not schematized. We could spend all day long doing this. Uh, so here I have some even weirder examples or exemplars of the category poodle. Um, you are probably thinking there is something, there's something so wrong about this. Probably, I don't know, maybe you like them, maybe you hate them, I don't know. Uh, but right now the point is that um, even if they are so weird, uh, you should be able to some extent to recognize some poodleness, that there's something about those, your schema of poodles being applied to these other poodles. And if you just keep looking for more and more examples of poodles, for instance, in, in Pinterest, on Pinterest, you can see that some of these are not actually poodles, but the ones that are poodles uh, show a very weird, rare, strange, non-typical uh, characteristics. And nonetheless, for some of them, you do recognize there's, there's something of your schema of poodles being applied to them. Um, here are some further examples. Of course, some of them are really, really weird, but, but there's some schema being applied. There's something that still persists about your schema of, of poodles here. And the same goes here. Um, in some cases, they are even combining some properties, traits, characteristics, whatever word you want to choose to define the fact that, for instance, this one here on the left is supposed to have something about lions, 
So um, how much of your schema is still being applied for those very rare marginal members of this category? Here I have some others. So as I said, we could spend all day long looking for more and more examples of uh, poodles, but they could still all, we would still expect them all to share something in common. And whatever is being shared in common is what belongs to or is part of our schematization. So here um, I have a general claim, your schematization of poodle has probably changed as a result of today's experience, I guess. I guess, because it, it, that's what we expect. That's in fact part of uh, what Professor Casasanto argues in his paper of all meaning is ad hoc meaning. So the, the original question was, how do we define schematization and specification for this example on, in which the category thing is very, very, very schematic and the category poodle is not so schematic. Of, of course, that doesn't mean that we don't have a schema or a schematization of poodle, we do, but it's not, it's not as a schematic as thing because thing includes far many more exemplars of the world, of the universe than the category poodle does. Now, uh, we, you, we, want to apply the same idea, the same schema, in fact, that we have built thus far to verbs. So we can apply it to these examples. Of course, of course, these are not the only verbs in English, but these are just to talk about schematization. So evidently the verb do is far more schematic than the verb act. And the verb act is more schematic than the verb propel, and propel is more schematic than throw, and throw is more schematic than fleeing. Uh, this is for sure more abstract than and more schematic than poodles on things. Uh, why do I say that it, it is more schematic? Because the thing about verbs is that verbs involve some change over time. And that change over time makes it more schematic because you got to include more uh, schematic information. But before we continue, I'd like to start giving um, short, brief definitions. In cognitive grammar, nouns profile things and verbs profile processes. So that's a very important distinction. Uh, nouns, the grammatical category that we all use every day in order to teach students or prepare our classes or discuss uh, our teaching endeavors um, are actually in cognitive grammar, uh, terminologically speaking, uh, defined as things and verbs are processes. Um, this issue is actually quite complex. Um, I'm showing you here um, some information on page 99 of the, of the book that I asked you to please start reading. And what we should notice from here is that we have in fact a distinction between entities and things. I will show you in a second what that difference is. Uh, but you should notice also that we have nouns on the left and verbs on the right. And we have non-processual non relationships and non-processual relationships that are complex. We have simplex and complex non-processual relationships. So what I'm trying to say right now is that um, this issue, this problem is actually far more complex than, than, what, I'm, than what I've been saying and than, than what I will be saying for the rest of today's meeting. Um, I would love to go into the details, but because we only have 100 minutes, I will continue to keep it at a very basic level. But um, if, if you want to uh, know in more depth the, this issue or, or the, the problems surrounding this issue, well, you have the book and you could um, go much further uh, than I will do so today. Um, so yeah, what is the difference between um, 
thing and entity. The word entity is adopted for uh, a purpose that is um, problematized above. And it, it applies to anything that might be conceived of or referred to in describing conceptual structure. So um, there is in fact in cognitive grammar, a more general, more schematic term or word that we use in order to include not only things, but also relations, quantities, sensations, changes, locations, dim dimensions, and so on. Uh, that means that entity is more schematic than thing. Things are in cognitive grammar nouns, but of course uh, our linguistic mental processes involve more than just nouns. So the term entity is more general, more schematic than thing. And I want to make sure that, that, that we all agree or that we all understand that for Langacker in cognitive grammar, here it is, uh, a noun profiles a thing. I, I, I really want to, to make sure that, that that's something that, that we all agree that, that it is stated by Langacker, a noun profiles a thing. And here um, on, on page 151, uh, Langacker discusses the analogy of the count mass uh, difference, the internal count mass difference of nouns. There are two types of nouns, uh, the ones that you typically know as countable and non-countable nouns, uh, you know, like water is a non-countable noun. Uh, whereas chair is a countable noun. So we have a count and mass nouns. And just the same, we have um, perfective and imperfective processes, which are basically verbs. We have verbs that are perfective and verbs that are imperfective. And all of them are processes. I won't go into all those details. I'm just giving you this information just to let you know that um, there is actually far much more than, than what I've been saying and what I will be saying, but I want to keep all this discussion today at a basic introductory, introductory level. Um, so um, let's talk about grammatical schematization. I've been giving you examples of, I started giving you examples of nouns. Uh, I started saying thing, creature, animal, the poodle. Then I gave you very briefly a, a, an example of verbs with do, act, propel, throw, and fling. Uh, but those examples are examples of words. We haven't talked about grammatical rules such as going to, or will, or, or present perfect, or future perfect, or present perfect continues. Uh, those are more, far, much more, a lot, much more schematic. And, and that's, that's where I want to get to. So in essence, grammatical rules are schematizations. Um, not very different, not extremely different from what I was saying uh, in essence, but there are differences that we need to account for. Uh, so schematizations are of a higher, uh, degree of abstraction. Schematizations of our grammatical rules are schematizations of our culturally most important cognitive routines. So going to present perfect continuous, active voice, passive voice, um, uh, conditional zero, conditional one, conditional two, all of those um, grammatical rules are simply schematizations of are culturally most important cognitive routines. So uh, this is the proposal of Langacker. Uh, you probably saw it uh, in the reading. I want to discuss this. I uh, think this is what should matter to us today the most. So let's start uh, with the discussion of the first um, figure on the left. So let's analyze this. We have two axes, one for symbolic complexity and another for entrenchment and conventionality. Let me explain that. Uh, symbolic complexity is actually not a very difficult uh, conceptual term to understand. Basically what we're saying when we talk about 
symbolic complexity is how many different uh, phonological units we have. So for example, the word moon, Luna, uh, the moon, um, is a symbolic structure of very low complexity because we barely have any phonemes. It's just the m, the u, and the n, mun. And that's not symbolically very complex. Uh, night, moonless night, a night at which there is no moon, a, a, a moonless night is just a little bit more complex. And, and that can get very complex the more information, the more the more morphemes, the more uh, ideas we include in an expression. So for instance, if we take a, a phrasal verb, such as break down, break down is going to have a higher degree of complexity. If we take a, an, an idiom, um, for instance, it's raining dogs and cats, that has a much higher, much, much higher degree of, of symbolic complexity. So basically what we mean by symbolic complexity is how many different uh, sounds and concepts are involved in one given expression. And then entrenchment and conventionality, this the conventionality is a synonym of entrenchment basically, um, refers to how many times we have heard a word and thus how much we are likely to react to that word, uh, how much is activated and how easily this is activated in our, in our brains. So for instance, uh, dach is a very, very well entrenched word in our minds. Uh, we have no difficulty in, in, in recalling, uh, being able to bring to our minds what a dach is. But there are some other words that we don't use so often or maybe don't even recognize so easily because we have hardly ever used them. And those are the least entrenched examples. So that's, that's basically uh, what this means, that some words are more commonly used, that they are more entrenched, more um, easily recalled in our minds than others and symbolic complexity is just what I was saying. And so we have this separation between novel expressions and lexical items. Novel expressions are words that, uh, for instance, in Spanish, we have nowadays words or new verbs such as Facebooker. We, we didn't have Facebooker or Twitter or, or um, maybe Instagramer. I'm not sure if some people say Instagramer, but, but if, if if somebody does, well, that's a novel expression. And of course, if a word is very conventional, that's what we call a lexical item uh, because it has been used for so long that it has become part of the general norm that everybody accepts uh, what it is. So for instance, I don't think you would, it, it would be very difficult to find somebody who is not able to um, tell us what a dog is. But maybe if, if I ask my students, uh, my students who are 15 years old or 14 years old, what they, what they know about the word cantinflar, uh, well, uh, that would be for them, maybe not for me, but that would be for them a novel expression. And that, that is not so entrenched anymore as it used to be. So that's for that's that, that's basically what we can say about the, the figure 1.4a. Now, what about 1.4b? 1.4b actually uh, incorporates the first figure, the one on the left. So everything I said about this figure on the left is covered or included here. Um, but here, Langacker is emphasizing prototypical lexical items, the ones that are above, the ones that are more conventional. 
Uh, of course, some were uh, in the corner, in a very small, narrow region, we have novel expressions. But we want to emphasize the fact that uh, prototypical lexical items uh, in, on this other figure are here in, in this corner, as opposed to grammatical rules. So grammatical rules such as present perfect, future perfect, present perfect continuous, uh, present progressive, uh, future present, um, future progressive, etc., are what we typically call grammatical rules. Passive voice, um, all of that is what we call our rules. What you should remember from this figure is that in cognitive grammar, we argue that the difference between words such as da. Or, or the verb do, or the verb throw, whatever single word you want to talk about, or vehicle, or car, whatever word you want to mention as, as an example of a lexical item. The difference between lexical items and grammatical rules uh, is a difference of schematization and symbolic complexity. It's a continuum. What lexical items and rules have in common is that they both schematize cognitive routines and they both involve some degree of symbolic complexity. Some rules have a higher degree of symbolic complexity, just the same as some lexical items have a higher degree of, com of symbolic complexity. Some rules are more schematic and some lexical items are also more schematic. Um, but we don't have a strong separation. Uh, in your typical grammars, in your typical uh, traditional, I should say, in, in traditional grammars, in grammars that are not cognitive grammars, so, uh, so to speak, um, we usually have this strong separation in which uh, we have, you could say, a box for the lexicon, uh, all the words of, of all the vocabulary, we have dictionaries. And on the other hand, we have a separation, a rigid separation for an, with, with another box for grammatical rules. This separation in cognitive grammar is artificial and it doesn't help. This artificial separation doesn't help to understand what grammar really is and ultimately what language really is. If we really want to understand language, we have to stop thinking about two different boxes, totally separated one from the other, lexicon over there, uh, grammar over there, uh, lexical items over there, separated from grammatical rules over there somewhere else. This separation is the result of a, an oversimplification of language. Of course, it's it's natural that it's just natural that, um, let's say, fifty years ago or forty years ago or one hundred years ago, uh, we didn't have an understanding of this because you know science takes time. It's not like science springs from nothing just one day to the other. It takes time to to arrive at these sort of conclusions. So. Um, I'm not trying to say with what I've been saying these last five minutes that traditional grammars are useless. Actually, they are very helpful, but they're helpful only to some extent, after which their traditional separation is no longer useful. And we need a more versatile, a more realistic representation of language and grammatical rules. Um, and here, Langacker also states that uh, lexical items are not schematic at all, well, sorry. They are schematic, but not as schematic as markers or um, class uh, categories. So let's see that in, in, in further detail, what, what, what it means to, to say that we have these, uh, oh, by the way, before I continue, uh, these uh, dotted lines, these uh, non-continuous lines are there only to remind us uh, that even if this is a continuum, it doesn't mean that we are not able to 
uh, establish categorizations or conceptual categories of what we typically call uh, words, uh, grammatical markers, grammatical classes, and grammatical rules. Um, but these, these non-continuous lines are not rigid at all. They're just there to remind us that, that the fact that there are continua, conceptual continuums, doesn't mean that we cannot establish uh, conceptual categories such as the ones that, that are being shown there. So let's see an example of, of one um, of one schema, one schematization, which is noun plus less. So we have the examples moonless, childless, hopeless, treeless, fruitless, cordless, etc. That that's probably not your prototypical grammatical rule. Your prototypical grammatical rule is uh, going to, will, present perfect, future perfect continuous, passive voice, uh, conditional one, conditional zero. It, that, that's your prototypical grammatical rule. This is not what you would normally um, think about as grammar plainly set. Uh, when, when somebody tells you, uh, you, I want to study grammar, or I need to teach grammar, or I need my students to improve their grammar. Usually this is not what you think about. You don't think of these examples. These are not the examples that come to your mind. Nonetheless, they are part of, of, of the grammar. The fact that they are not your prototypical examples of, of a grammatical rule doesn't mean that they are not part of grammar. They are part of grammar at a less schematic and less symbolically complex level. That's what it is. Uh, it is that symbolic complexity is is uh, of a lower degree, and the schemas and the schematicity is also not so high. But it's still it's still part of the of of the of the grammar. Um, we have here another example. Uh, what if we add another element to these examples of Vov? Then we have a different schema that is built using uh, the first schema. We use this first schema or schematization in order to build a more schematic and symbolically more complex grammar um, schema, which is noun, plus, less, uh, and another noun. For example, moonless night, childless couple, hopeless situation, treeless plane, fruitless search, and cordless, cordless phone. So I, I hope these examples uh, are clear enough to get a first idea of what we mean when we say that we have a conceptual continuum from lexical items to grammatical rules. We really, really need to stop thinking that, that words or lexical items are somewhere over there, st st strictly separated with nothing having to do with grammatical rules and grammatical rules coming from one ethereal, mysterious place in the universe. No, rules or grammatical rules are simply um, schematizations that are symbolically more complex and of a higher abstraction. That's what they are, but, but they are not so different from, from words. Um, I think I have a comment in the chat. Just let me see what it is, just to see if there's a question or something. Uh, teacher Patineira says novel expression. Yeah, Googler, yeah, that's right. Uh, we didn't have this term, I don't know, let's say 12 years ago. I'm not sure what year Google became so um, popular as it is today. Oh, and I have another, some other comments here. So I'm sorry, teacher Rocio, that I didn't uh, say uh, good afternoon um, when you um, said. Um, and teacher Mary Christian, the same. Sorry for not uh, saying hello uh, when you were saying hello. I was a little bit distracted with the beginning of the presentation. Uh, uh, here, the image of my dog, are those even dogs? <laughs> yeah, um, the, 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 those that didn't look like very common normal dogs 
are still part of the category dogs, but they are not at all prototypical dogs, just like ostriches are not prototypical birds. And, and most importantly, I will later argue that there are some uses, some instantiations of going to, over, and present perfect that are not prototypical, that are, you could say, weird instantiations of the grammatical rules of the grammatical rules of going to and present perfect and the lexical grammatical item uh, over. I, I hope we will discuss that in one or two weeks. Um, so yeah, novel expressions, Google Air, um, yeah, there are many different uh, novel expressions um, that come and go. For example, not, right now we have TikTok. TikTok in itself is a novel expression. We don't even have to think about TikTok ad or something like that. It's not necessary. That's the simple fact that nobody talked about TikTok two years ago. And now, more and more often, we talk about TikTok makes it a novel expression. But of course, if you look around all the different apps that you can download from, uh, to your cell phone and that you probably don't even know that that young people are using, all of those are novel expressions. Um, of course, those are uh, what we call proper names, uh, but they're still novel expressions. Uh, so let me read uh, this uh, passage that I extracted directly from Langacker's book. It says here, uh, the schematic assemblies describing grammatical patterns can also exhibit any degree of symbolic complexity. Simpler schemas are often incorporated as components of more complex ones, which is what I was trying to show here. And, and that's what, he, and, and these examples are taken directly from this part of, of Langacker's book. For instance, additives like moonless, childless, hopeless, trueless, fruitless, and coreless instantiate a derivational pattern that we can write as noun plus less, which is what I, um, I typed above. This schematic symbolic assembly is one component of first noun plus less uh, and the second noun, as in moonless nine, childless couple, hopeless situation, treeless plane, fruitless search, colorless form. So, so um, if we just take the word moon, the word moon is not very uh, symbolically complex and uh, is not very schematic in the sense that, in the sense that, um, that moon is very specific. Um, but when I say, uh, when I apply um, a grammatical suffix such as less to the word moon, I get a new construct that is using a very, very schematic schema, which is a noun in general plus less. So moonless is using a very schematic or much more schematic uh, scheme or construction or pattern than moon does. And it's also symbolically more complex because you're adding more uh, symbolic meaning and forms, which is less to the, to the expression. So, so you have this uh, relatively simple, relatively simple schema, noun one plus less, that you can use in order to build a more complex and more schematic schema, which is noun one plus less and another noun. Now, uh, let's, let's make this even more schematic. Let's, let's analyze a more schematic and more symbolically complex uh, schema which is a verb of, um, oh, I forgot the mean of S, just give me a second. Yeah, verb of, of striking. Yeah, the S means, stands for striking. Verb of striking, you know, uh, such as uh, hitting, kicking, uh, and poking, that's, that's what Langacker means by verbs of striking. Uh, X means uh, somebody or something in the uh, body noun. So body noun means that it's a noun referring to a part of, of, of our body, such as our back, our shin, uh, not shin, shin, uh, or an eye. 
So we, we have here three different examples. Hit somebody in the back. I, I don't know, I could hit my, my brother in the back. I could hit my dog in the back. I could hit uh, a toy in the back. I could hit uh, my cousin in the back. There are many different peoples or, or objects or things in the world that I could hit. Um, and then I could also uh, kick somebody or something in the scene, or I could poke somebody or something in the eye. So these three examples share how they have a common schema, which is verb of um, striking um, a noun or somebody or something uh, in, the, in a part of, of their body. So this is uh, a schema. This schema is symbolically more complex than, than these ones that we were checking in three minutes ago. Three minutes ago. Um, and the schematicity is also higher. The schematicity here is uh, higher than the one that we found here. Uh, because we can use so many different verbs of striking, uh, we can talk about so many different people or objects of the world. And there are so many different parts of the body that we could refer to, not necessarily the back, not necessarily the shin, and not necessarily the eye. It could be, I don't know, uh, the, the hand or, or the head or any other part of the body that you may wish to come up with. Uh, so this is more schematic and symbolically more complex. And here we have another example that is even more schematic. The, the, the example above is quite schematic, but the second example here is even more schematic. Why do we say that this is even more schematic? Well, because now we want to increase the schematicity of the verb, and now we're going to talk about verbs of contact. Here, it, th these were verbs of striking. Striking in the sense that uh, there is some force that you are exerting over a part of the body of a person. Uh, and that's usually not very nice, not very pleasant. It's something, um, I mean, nobody wants to get hit, I think. Well, not, I, some people have some issues and they do want to get hit, but, uh, but generally people don't want to get hit. Generally people don't like to get kicked. And generally speaking, people don't like to get poked. Uh, whereas here, whereas here, we have another type of verb that covers, that includes the ones above, but also includes far many other more verbs, because these are verbs of contact, such as kiss, grasp, chuck, and grab. So this is more general, and because it is more general, uh, we say that this is a more schematic um, or construction. So we have a, a, a schematization uh, of a higher degree. And um, you could also say that it is symbolic, uh, symbolically more complex because the, the number of verbs that are included here is greater. So uh, in terms of the symbols, the uh, semantic pole, not the formal pole, but the well, both the semantic and for and, and formal pole. This includes many more verbs than the one above. Um, and so it, here we have kiss somebody on the cheek, grasp somebody by the wrist, uh, chuck somebody under the chin, and grab somebody around the waist. These are instantiations of the schema uh, verb of contact X in the body noun. Now, um, everything I said um, in the last two or three minutes is summarized here below. So please let me read just to, uh, just to sum up what I've been saying. Schematization can be carried to any degree. In particular, expressions give rise to low level schemas like hit X in the back, kick X in the shin, and poke X in the eye. These in turn support the extraction of the higher level schema verb of striking X in the body noun, these may then instantiate a still more abstract schema based on a wider array of data. For instance, 
uh, verb of contact, XP, the body noun, where verb of contact, well, it's a verb of contact, could also subsume such patterns as, that's why it's more schematic, as kiss X on the cheek, grasp X by the wrist, chuck X under the chin, and grab X around the waist. These examples further show that the different components of a complex symbolic assembly can be schematic to varying degrees. Um, let me read this other um, passage from, from Langacker's book. Uh, question, where does, le does lexicon stop and grammar begin? That's what I was saying uh, about 10 or 15 minutes ago. The point, of course, is that there is no particular place. Uh, it's a continuum. It's a conceptual continuum, which is something I tried to emphasize as much as I could the very first time that we met about four weeks ago. But this is not to say that no distinction can be drawn. What I was telling you that it doesn't mean that we cannot be, that we are not able to establish conceptual categories. Uh, the key parameter is specificity. To the extent that symbolic as assemblies are specific, they could tend to be regarded as lexical, what we what we typically call or traditionally call words, both traditionally and in cognitive grammar. So that's something that, that is in common uh, in traditional grammars, such as the ones that you can buy from uh, Oxford University or Cambridge University or Richmond or National Geographic, you know, the, the typical uh, commercial publishers. To the extent that they are schematic, they could generally be considered grammatical. So here Langacker is basically telling us that um, in traditional terms and also in cognitive grammar, uh, to the extent that something is um, specific, very specific, you will say that it is a word. And to the extent that you say that something is schematic or that you think of something in, in very schematic terms, you will be more prone to saying that you're talking about a uh, grammar issue. Uh, but there are many intermediate regions that are very important. Um, thus, lexicon can be characterized as residing in fairly specific symbolic assemblies and gram grammar in more schematic ones. So that's a, a, a basic division. That's a simple way to put things. So you have lexicon on the one hand and you have grammar on the other hand. But remember, there are many, many intermediate regions. Toward the two extremes are clear cases unequivocal, unequivocably, sorry, I don't usually read that word. Toward the two extremes are, cl are clear cases unequivocal, unequivocably, sorry, identifiable as lexical or grammatical. So yeah, for instance, dog versus a pattern of forming relative clauses. So uh, if you ask somebody, uh, what the word dog is. Is dog a lexical item or a, or a grammatical rule? Well, of course, we are all going to say that a dog is a word. It is not a grammatical rule. But that doesn't mean that there is no grammar in dog. Dog has some grammar, but, but not a prototypical grammar, a, a, a type of grammar that... Um, requires us to think about symbolic com complexity and entrenchment. That's, that's, those are the aspects of grammar that are involved in the analysis of what a dog is versus a pattern for, for so relative clauses are one typical, I would even say prototypical example of grammatical rule or, sim or simply said grammar. Uh, in between, this is the interesting part for me, um, interesting because not many people talk about this. Uh, in between lie many structures, such as verb of striking X in the body noun, val validly thought of either way. When he says either way, you can think of this particular expression as a mother, a problem of the lexicon, or as a mother, as a problem of grammar. Where exactly do you draw the line? How, how do you decide if this pattern, this uh, schema is a problem of, of the mental lexical or, or, or if it is a problem of uh, the uh, mental grammar that every individual or person speaker of English has? 
uh, in between lie many structures such as verb of strike in Exingdon, but in now validly thought of either way, depending on one's purpose. Yeah, so at different times and, and different moments, uh, sometimes you could you could find more useful to think of this schema as a problem of the lexicon and at some other moments with different purposes you could prefer to think of this as a grammatical rule or construction or a, or simply said a problem of grammar i think i have to comment on the chat um although we say them in english they are considered novel expressions for instance tic tac <laughs> for instance yeah um uh, yeah, they're, they're novel expressions, and that's just, that's just, I was going to say that's just language, and yes, that's just language, but I'm, I will even say that's just life. Life is changing. So it's just natural that new words are coming on and off. Um, okay, so uh, more from Langaker, directly from the book of Langaker. Um, the claim then is that grammar reduces us to, to schematic symbolic assemblies. Um, so yeah, this is a, a very, I would say, bold um, assert, assertion. Um, this is a, a let me, oh, let me, let me close my, here, yeah, so that, that we don't get that noise. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn off the volume of my cell phone. Uh, so the claim is, then is that grammar reduces to schematic symbolic assemblies. So th that's very bold to say, I think, because uh, I've heard many, many people uh, here in Escuela Nacional Preparatoria, also in Universidad Autónoma de Tlaxcala, when I used to work here in, in the Autónoma de Tlaxcala, um, in, in, um, I used to work, I worked for some time at, um, the language center of um, la Facultad de uh, Contaduría y Administración. Um, I mean, I've just like you, I've been working in so many places and I've heard so many people talking about grammar. Um, and if you told people, uh, if you ask people to ask for a definition of grammar, of course, you're going to find many different uh, definitions, perceptions, opinions, uh, experiences, purposes, uh, interests, that define the way every person defines what grammar is. And here Langacker is giving us such a, a, an apparently, apparently simple definition. Grammar reduces to schematic symbolic assemblies. But by now you should very probably notice that schematization is a very complex issue. At the same time, it's not so complex, but at first, when, we, when one is starting to try to understand what we mean by schematization in cognitive grammar and in cognitive linguistics, more generally speaking, uh, there's so much to say about schematization. There, there's really so much. And then symbolization, uh, how do we construct symbols is also a very complex issue. And there are so many things we could say about symbolization. And the same goes for assemblies. Uh, I didn't ex explain today what symbolic assemblies are, but I hope most of you have a chance to read the first pages of the um, book, uh, Cognitive Grammar and Introduction from Langacker 2008. Because uh, it's, it's not really a big, uh, at least not at, at first, it becomes increasingly more complex as you progress to analyze certain examples. But in principle, in essence, the definition of what a symbolic assembly is is, is not that difficult, I, I would say. Um, but what exactly does this mean? How does symbolic grammar work? Later sections and chapters answer these questions in some detail. For now, let us focus on three basic matters. Grammatical markers, grammatical classes, and grammatical rules. So remember, uh, all of these are gr grammatical markers, classes, and rules. And that's what we have here. Markers, classes, and rules. Let me show again. Grammatical markers, classes, and rules. Markers, 
classes and rules. So that's what are you what you gotta keep in mind right now. That Langacker is telling us that. Let me read again. Um, how does symbolic grammar work? Later sections and chapters answer these questions in some detail. For now, let us focus on three basic matters. Uh, these ones. These are the three basic matters: grammatical classes, grammatical markers, and grammatical rules. Uh, these are all describable by means of symbolic assemblies. What distinguishes them are the regions they occupy in the abstract space defined by the parameters of schematic schematicity and symbolic complexity. So you should also notice that for, for Langacker, these are parameters, uh, schematicity, uh, going uh, from uh, below to uh, above, and, and symbolic complexity going from left to right. Uh, this is just metaphoric, of course. This is just a metaphoric description. It doesn't mean that we have in our brains a region that is below and then a region that is above and a region that is on the left and a region that is on the right. No, no. That, this is just a metaphorical depiction, um, drawing, uh, representation, of, of a very abstract problem, which is what is language, what is grammar, um, and more specifically, what are grammatical markers, classes, and rules. So the difference between these markers, classes, and rules is a difference of symbolic complexity and schematicity. So you should notice that markers and classes are uh, somewhat less symbolically complex than rules. Um, and rules, what we typically call rules, occupy a, a, a greater region in, in, in this figure. Um, so it includes both, let's say, let me say it that way, uh, both intermediate schema schematicity and very high schematicity, whereas markers and classes uh, occupy a, a lesser uh, region of symbolic complexity. Markers and classes do not typically increase their symbolic complexity very much. And classes, grammatical classes, such as nouns, verbs, adverbs, etc., are more schematic than uh, grammatical markers. So that's basically what we we gotta we have to observe from this uh, figure here. Um, okay, let me read everything again. I'm sorry if I'm reading everything so ma so many times, but but I feel like these are uh, when it is the very first time that one encounters these uh, claims. I feel it's difficult. It takes some time to digest what Langacker is trying to, to tell us. So I'll just read this again. The claim then is that grammar reduces to schematic symbolic assemblies, but what exactly does this mean? How does symbolic grammar work? Later sections and chapters answer these questions in some detail. For now, let us focus on three basic matters, grammatical markers, grammatical classes, and grammatical rules. These are all describable by means of symbolic assemblies. What distinguishes them are the regions they occupy in the abstract space defined by the parameters of schematicity and symbolic complexity. So we have two parameters. The first parameter is schematicity and the second parameter is symbolic complexity. That's what we are being told here. Um, I was going to say something else, just give me a second. Um, oh yeah. Um, also, please, please remember that all of these drawings are there for didactic purposes. Um, of course, that, that language and grammar is much more than just a few lines and a few words there, but, but they're for didactic purposes, very helpful to help us uh, in an, at an introductory level to get an idea of what grammar is and what schematization is and what symbolic complexity is and how they relate to each other and how we have a conceptual continuum from lexical items to grammatical rules. So, so all of these drawings are there just for 
didactic purposes. And in that vein, um, these, these non-continuous lines separating markers and classes, uh, markers from classes and markers, markers on classes from rules are kind of artificial because these are actually uh, conceptual continua. Uh, there is a continuum from markers to classes and there is a continuum from markers and classes to rules. Um, very, try to think of, 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 of it or in terms of what we were discussing here. Here you have one transition from, from one degree of symbolic complexity to a slightly higher degree of, com of symbolic complexity and also from one uh, degree of schematicity to a slightly higher degree of schematicity. Uh, and, and, and the same goes for this example. Uh, in, in the first construction above, you have a, a, a slightly less symbolically complex construction and less schematic. And the second uh, construction or schema is just slightly, just a little bit more symbolically complex and just slightly a little bit more uh, schematic than, than the one above. Um, so th there is a conceptual continuum from each and every one of these conceptual categories to the, to the other. Uh, that's important because I wouldn't like you to keep or to get an idea, to get the idea or, or to have the wrong idea that these are rigid uh, separations with no interaction or no uh, inter intersection or no uh, intermediate regions. Uh, there are many, many intermediate regions, but for didactic purposes, we're separating um, this the way we're showing it right now. Okay, um, so now, now that we have this idea of uh, a continuum from uh, lexical items to grammatical rules, and we also have grammatical markers and classes, um, I'm going to show you here um, very quickly, I, because we don't have so much time, I will not go into much um, detail, but I do want to show you that uh, given more time, uh, if you want to take the time to, to analyze these uh, some other day uh, that you have time, um, Langacker does offer um, an explanation of what grammatical markers are, what grammatical classes are, and what grammatical rules are. Um, I'm just giving you here this very, very uh, short, uh, you could even say cherry-picked uh, definitions or explanations of these three uh, grammatical regions, markers, classes, and rules. So let's see. Um, as part of the expressions, grammatical markers are specific at the phonological pole since they have to be capable of overt realization. Even those reasonably ascribed as schematic phonological value, like a redu, 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 I think it's redu, applicative morpheme or the re regular English past tense, acquire specific segmental content in a given expression. On the other hand, grammatical markers tend to be quite schematic at the semantic pole. Otherwise, they would be simply uh, be like they could simply be lexical items. There is little agreement among linguists concerning which elements to identify as grammatical rather than lexical. Examples commonly treated both ways include prepositions, for example, for, to, add like. We're going to discuss the preposition over, which is a grammatical marker according to what we're reading right now. Modals, may, can, will, shall, must, and indefinite pronouns such as someone, anywhere, everybody, whatever, who, uh, these all resemble can canonical lexical items. Um, so yeah, because grammatical markers um, are here just above uh, lexical items and approaching uh, grammatical rules, of course, they, they present some uh, characteristics that makes us think of them as lexical items, but they also have some other properties or characteristics that makes us uh, that make us think of them as grammatical rules. They're like sort of intermediate regions of language, of grammar, of, of language grammar. Um, well, I know, I know, I know, I am, I am well aware that this explanation is not. Uh, it's kind of obscure. There's so much we 
would have to explain to have a better understanding of what the grammatical markers are. But but I just wanted to give you this at least short, uh, brief uh, definition or explanation of what grammatical markers are. Um, now here, um, grammatical classes. Uh, grammatical markers are closely related. That means that they are somehow similar to, you could say, uh, two grammatical classes, which they often serve to, de to derive or signal. A class per se, however, is not overly manifested, but resides in a set of symbolic structures that function alike in certain respects. Cognitive grammar maintains that grammatical classes are definable in symbolic terms and more controversial, controversially that basic classes like noun, verb, additive, and adverb can be given uniform semantic characterizations. Um, if you want to know more about that, uh, you have to read chapter four. Hence, the members of a class all instantiate a schematic description representing their abstract commonality. For instance, the bipolar schema defining the noun class nouns can be written as thing, you know, the, the um, formal phonological pole, um, yeah, I think that, that the uppercase letters represent the formal poll. I might be wrong. I will check it out later. Where thing specifies that a noun refers to a thing in the most general sense of that term. And um, um, oh, I forgot how to call these ones. Um, but those points indicate that no particular phonological properties are specified. Um, so no particular phonological properties as per specify. What it means for an expression to be a noun is that it instantiates this schema. So here we have this example, uh, moon, tooth, um, toothbrush, and moonless night. Moon, toothbrush, and moonless night are all nouns because each is a symbolic structure that designates a thing. Uh, most nouns elaborate the schema both semantically and phonologically. Arguably, though, the grammatical element thing, uh, the one appearing in forms like something, nothing, and anything, is more specific only at the phonological at the phonological pole. Thus, in accordance with Figure 1.4b, the one that we were checking, the noun class description is schematic at both poles. The grammatical formative thing is schematic semantically, but phonological specific at and a typical lexical item like moon is also more is also semantically specific. Um, so I'm, once again, I, I apologize that this explanation here is, is rather obscure. Um, I only have 20 more minutes for today's meeting. So um, it could take me probably 10 precious min minutes to explain this in, 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 a more, in a clearer way, but I at least wanted you to um, be sure that we do have definitions and we are able to discuss and if possible, at some other time, we will discuss uh, what, how we define grammatical classes um, along this continuum in cognitive grammar. And finally, grammatical rules occupy the remaining portion of the abstract space de depicted in figure 1.4b. Uh, by rule, I simply mean the characterization of some pattern. In cognitive grammar, rules take the form of schemas. They are abstract templates obtained by reinforcing the commonality inherent in inherent or inherent. I don't remember. In a set of instances, since grammatical rules are patterns in the formation of symbolically complex expressions, they are themselves symbolically complex as well as schematic. Complex expressions consist, consist of specific blah, 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 blah. So once again, um, I, I didn't really plan to explain today in, in very much detail what grammatical markers are or what grammatical classes are and or what grammatical rules are, because that would take uh, far more time than, than we actually have. But I did want you to have a sense, a general sense uh, of, of, of what Langacker refers to by grammatical markers, classes, and rules. And most importantly, that we have this separation of markers, classes, and rules in terms of two parameters, the parameter of symbolic complexity and the parameter of schematicity. So um, we will say that markers have a lower schematicity and a lower comp symbolic complexity than grammatical rules, and also than 
grammatical classes, but both grammatical classes and markers have a lower uh, degree of symbolic complexity and usually a lower um, degree of schematicity than grammatical rules. That's, that's basically what I want you to uh, get from today's meeting. Um, and well, uh, that's basically all that I prepared for today. And luckily, we still have about 15 minutes. So I would like to see if you have any um, questions or comments or, or something you think you feel I didn't explain um, sufficiently enough. Um, last time I didn't even, yeah, teacher Murray, Kristen. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, that was a very, very uh, theoretically explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could we go to the examples now? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I'll, I'll give some examples in a, in a moment. Just first, please let me see if there are any other um, comments or questions um, before we tackle some more um, specific. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to more specific instantiations with going to and present perfect, because that's, that's the idea. The idea, uh, just give me two minutes to explain um, why I, I am following this uh, way of, 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 of working. Um, yeah, the idea is that um, we are able to use all these theoretical, very abstract uh, notions and concepts to analyze something that is much more specific, which is going to and the, the so-called present perfect and the preposition over. So, um, well, I think nobody else has any questions or comments. So I think we could use these last 15 minutes in order to talk about, in order to talk about um, going to. Um, I like discussing going to because uh, it's, it's one grammatical rule. Let me share my screen again. Um, I think it's this one. No, give me a second, please. Oh, yeah. I think it's here. No, that's not the one. I'm sorry. Just give me another second. Um, I hope this is the one. No, sir. Here it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, going to is a more uh, specific, more concrete um, instantiation of a grammatical rule that I really, really want to discuss. And I will use these last uh, 14 minutes of today's meeting in order to talk about that. But before I do that, I would like to also emphasize that uh, either next week or in two weeks, no, sorry, that once we finish, when we finish this seminar, uh, I'm going to open, uh, I hope you can join, uh, a workshop in which we will develop, I already developed some, but I want to develop more, uh, practical materials to teach students uh, all this grammar, uh, in the next school year, beginning in, I guess, August the, the 9th, I think. So, well, uh, there is a practical end to all of this, but let's let's use these last 30 minutes to talk about going to. So what can we say about going to? Uh, first of all, oh, now let me share something else. I'm going to share a screen. So now you will see everything that I do, not only my, not only my PowerPoint, but everything that I have here. And um, so last, last, class, class, sorry, meeting. Last meeting, um, you remember, I was showing you this um, uh, composition of different pictures 
uh, in which I am trying to give you an idea of the schematization of the verb go. Go is a, uh, symbolically speaking, the, com the symbolic complexity is very low. Uh, go has only two phonemes, uh, gu and o. Well, you know that typically we say that this diphthong is just one phoneme. And does the, those two phonemes or sounds that we articulate when we say go compose the phonological uh, pole of the symbolic structure go? What about the semantics? What is the semantic content? What is the conceptual content of the verb go? I also already gave a, a general uh, explanation of the verb go last meeting when I said that the verb go as any other motion verb has a beginning point and a final point or destination and you have a trajectory or a, a pathway along which you, you are going to go. Um, we have other verbs such as walk or run. The difference be with, between uh, go, walk, and run is that with go, you don't specify the manner of motion. With, with walk, you specify that you go at a certain pace that is not way too fast usually, unless you say that you were walking fast. And run is uh, another motion verb that specifies that you are going in a very fast way with a very specific type of uh, biomechanical motion. Um, so every time that you use the verb go, for instance, I go to the market, I go to school, I go to the bathroom, I go to bed, I go to see my parents, I go to uh, the kitchen, uh, I go to uh, the movies, etc., etc., etc. Uh, you are basically uh, schematizing um, a, a motion event. Um, there is something in common between all of these different uses of the verb go. And that's, that's just the basic one. I'm going to make this a little bit more complex in, in two or three minutes. Uh, but right now, I just want you to get a sense that uh, the verb go is in itself already a, a lexical item uh, in fact, a prototypical lexical, lexical item that has certain degree of sch schematicity and certain degree of symbolic complexity. Now, um, what happens, uh, uh, what has happened in English and also in Spanish over the centuries as language evolved uh, in a way that nowadays we use the verb go not only to talk about motion uh, uh, through space, but also to talk, to talk about uh, so to speak, motion through time. So we can say something like, I, I'm i going to think about it. So, so I don't know, somebody makes me an offer or a proposal uh, like Sergio, what if we do this or that? What if we give a course next, uh, next year? What if we uh, make some materials? Somebody proposes something to me or to you or to anybody. And we can say, I don't know, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to consider it. When we say I'm going to uh, consider it, consider it, think about it, uh, we are schematizing. That's a, a that's a but that's a schematization of a much higher schematicity and symbolic complexity than I go to the market, I go to school, I go to to the kitchen, the degree of schematicity and the degree of symbolic complexity is much higher. The symbolic complexity increases uh, partly because now you are not only using go, but you are also using the verb to be. And that's something that um, either um, inductively or deductively or whichever uh, methodology you prefer to use uh, with students, um, it's gotta be there somewhere when you're teaching it. You, you gotta include somewhere the verb to be. If, if you do it communicatively uh, in a communi communicative setting and or an inductive setting or a problem-based setting or a task-based setting or whatever methodology you have chosen to use, um, there's no way you can escape the fact that the verb to be has to be there. So the symbolic complexity has necessarily increased. And the schematicity has also, has also increased because now 
you cover a much wider range of situations. Uh, my initial examples were very simple. Go somewhere, I'll follow in a certain trajectory. But now with all of these examples of I'm going to think about it, I'm going to, uh, or let me give, give another even more complex example. It's going to rain. W what is that? It's going to rain. Who is going where? Do you have a person that is going from po point A to point B in the expression, it's going to rain? Uh, you should notice that the, the expression is going to rain is much more schematic than I, 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 I go to school every day or every Monday or from Monday to Friday. The schematicity of it's going to ra rain um, of the construction that we use or that uh, makes it possible to say it's going to rain, that, that schema has a, uh, a higher degree of schematicity and a higher degree of symbolic complexity than those first initial examples that I gave. Um, but something is, is being, you could say, lost. There is something that is being lost that we're losing when we say it's going to rain. Uh, Teacher Mary Kristen, what would you say that is being lost or could you say that nothing is being lost in terms of uh, symbolic complexity and schematicity uh, in an example such as it's going to rain versus I go to school every Monday? What do you think, teacher? Well, um, yeah. that's a very, difficult question because the two sentences that you just gave me are quite different yeah so um it's going to rain and and uh and which is the other uh i go to school every monday or or from monday to friday yeah i'm just trying to to, to emphasize the fact that this second example refers to uh motion um through space, such as walking or running. So yeah, it's going to rain versus uh, I go to school from Monday to Friday. Um. There, there's, there's my, my claim, my, my, assess, my assertion is that the first one is going to rain um, is using a more schematic construction and a more symbolically complex construction, then I go to um, school uh, from Monday to Friday. Uh, and that when we are schematizing, we are losing something. And, and okay, what I was trying to get at is that what we are losing is specificity. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but I, I, that's something that I want, I would like to emphasize as strong as I can. Um, what specificity do you think we are losing, uh, teacher Mary Christine? Uh, very, very difficult question for me. I really don't uh, don't get what you want me uh, to uh, answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm probably not. I'm actually not being very helpful uh but what i'm okay I'm, let, let me try to explain it um what i'm trying to say right now is that uh the grammatical rules that we have for the use of going to in order to talk about the future um that are somewhere over here in this region of of grammatical rules um are increasing elevating the degree of schematicity and the degree of symbolic complexity. And that has consequences as to how specific the information is. And the information that we are losing is basically space information. Uh, I go to school from Monday to Friday is more specific in the sense that we have a greater sense of trajectory uh, from point A, which is my house, 
to uh, Prepa 3, that is the final destination to where I went, want to get to. Um, how am I going to get to, to school by car, by, by, by a subway, walking, running, by bicycle? Uh, those are all of those are details that that we could discuss if we were to discuss the meaning of I go to I go to uh, school from Monday to Friday, and and those specific details are to a greater or lesser extent important. They are either implied or or um, over over uh, understood from the context of conversation. I go to school. But when we say it's going to rain, that doesn't really matter at all. Uh, how the rain is going to get here, if it's by bicycle, by car, that, that really doesn't matter. Because for that construction, the way of motion, how an entity, a thing of the world is going to get from point one to point B is no longer really important or not as much as it, as it was with, I go to school or I go to the kitchen. Um, so that means that it's going to re rain is more schematic, but it doesn't mean that it has lost everything. It doesn't mean that it has completely become completely fully abstract it preserves, there is some preservation uh, of, of the idea that there is a pathway, uh, uh, um, a trajectory. And that's exactly what affects the difference between going to uh, for predictions based on evidence uh, versus will for predictions. When we use going to for predictions based on evidence, such as it's going to rain or it's going to fall or uh, that car is going to crash uh, based on evidence because we're looking at the, the, the scene, the scenario, the context, uh, is preserving to some extent some information about uh, the fact that there is a, a, a trajectory, a very, very schematic trajectory. It's very, very schematic. It's no longer at a, a a space trajectory. It's a time trajectory. That is what is being preserved. And with will, no. If we say it will rain, we don't care about, we don't care anymore about that trajectory. It will rain. It sounds more instantaneous. Like it just happen. It will happen at some point, and we don't care about the trajectory. And that's that's the most important. One of the most important differences between. It's going to rain and it will rain. And, and that's why it is so important to have some knowledge about schematization if we really want to understand the difference between going to and will. Because the way they schematize our ideas of the world and our, our cognitive routines are very different. It's already 8.21 and I, and I know that, that many of you are very tired and I know that I didn't um, offer um, a great explanation today of this last in these last 15 minutes, but let me prepare something more better for next week. Uh, next week, we will not discuss any theoretical, I mean, I will not int introduce any more theoretical um, issues. I will just concentrate on spending 100 minutes explaining what I was trying to explain today uh, during these last 13 minutes. Um, and. I hope you can see uh, next week uh, how helpful this can be uh, once I am able to do it uh, with more appropriate time. Well, um, that's all for today, teachers. I, I, I'm really, really uh, grateful that you all made the effort to be here today. And and I hope- Professor Sergio, just yeah. a question. Yeah. Uh, also the novel expressions, uh, it, can, it, it could be called novel expressions, all the we say in English, for example, TikTok, Oh, the question is if that is considered a novel expression. Uh huh. Also, yes. we say in, in English because, like Patri, Patineira said, a novel expression is googlear. Yeah. Yeah, this is a novel expression, but when we say in English, TikTok, I, I don't remember now more Twitter. examples. Twitter. Twitter, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes when I remember my classes, 
uh, sometimes uh, one of my teachers told us that it is like um, more or less like Spanglish. The goglear, no? Oh, but, okay, okay, okay. Okay, but yeah. I think it's very, very nice. This the novel expressions, yes? Yeah. They are novel expression for us. Yeah, I, I, I feel like you have a, a sort of preoccupation or worry about uh, prescriptivism versus descriptivism. Prescriptiv mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Prescriptivists, okay. uh, prescriptivist, uh, prescriptiv prescriptivist people are very prone to judgments, to being judgmental, mm -hmm. to, to saying that that Spanish is slowly deteriorating. And, yes, and that's but in 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 not only in cognitive grammar but in linguistics in general yes we never judge uh, we, uh, the analogy i like to use to talk about this is imagine a biologist finding i don't know 10 or 20 uh, purple cats i think mm -hmm. i have never seen in my life a a purple cat but if i were a biologist i couldn't say that oh my god that's horrible this is a creation of of the demon and we should kill them all <laughs> No, as a biologist, as a scientist, I have to ask myself, why did they become purple? What, mm -hmm. in, what in the environment created the need mm -hmm. to, to evolve the mm -hmm. color of these cats to purple um, if that's something that we had never seen before? So mm -hmm. just the same in, in, in language, when we find new words or even new constructions or even new phonological patterns, um, we don't we don't condemn those mm -hmm. we we simply ask ourselves what is in the environment in the cultural in environment or the cognitive environment making it necessary for people to come up with these new either terms or phonological uh mm -hmm. intonations or or phenomena or or, or incorporation of even new uh, grammatical, because there are some, not very, not many, but there are a few new uh, grammatical rules uh, coming into the system little by little. Yes. And, but, but we don't condemn those. We just take them as, as interesting phenomena to be analyzed. Yeah. yeah. And maybe they try to categorize, no? They to like um, level, yeah. no? I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but yeah, they're they're, they're novel expressions, and I could add yes. that Googler is no longer well, not for the new generations. It is no longer a novel expression. I think that if I were to ask somebody who is about, let me say, let me guess, about eight or ten years old, yeah, that, that little child has heard the word Googler much more often than Cantinflar. So Googler yeah. is not a novel expression but rather a very common expression uh yeah. at least in his time life uh span maybe not for us but for him or her google is very natural just as natural as what uh buscar in el diccionario or something like that we all grew yes yeah. yeah yeah thank you thank you teacher okay so thank yeah. you teacher Thank you, teacher. I really, really, you know that I always feel so honored to uh, have the chance to share something uh, with you all. So thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm, I guess you must be tired, so I'll see you next uh, next week. And thanks so much for um, being here. I know your time is precious. I know I know it very well. So I'll Thank see you, you next much. week. Take care. Good night, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Sergio. Goodbye. Thank you, teacher. Yes, thank you. Thank you, teachers. I'll see you later.